You are listening to the Fly the W670 podcast. It is episode 33 of season three, the Cubs flounder against the fish. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on the socials, Fly the W670 on Twitter, Instagram, and of course on Facebook. You can email Crowley and I, fly the W670 at gmail.com. All right, Crowley, we had one of your uh, favorite events, a four game series against the uh, Marlinas. Things didn't go exactly well, and today the Cubs are getting a little rest on this Monday when we're recording the episode. Yep, I did the doubleheader, Dustin. I did the day-night doubleheader on Saturday, 18 innings of baseball, so uh, I have 17 and a half, luckily, but it was a crazy weekend. You know, the Cubs came back from a really tough road trip where they finished with a record of 5-4, and four. and Dustin, we talked about how the Cubs have had, you know, some difficult series to start the season. So far, they've had to face both teams that were in the World Series last year. They had to face the Vegas odds-on favorites to win the World Series and the Dodgers, in addition to that West Coast swing. So we were kind of hoping, you know, okay, the Marlins come limping in here with the second-worst record in baseball, hoping that the Cubs could feast, but that didn't happen. Uh, the Cubs were rained out on Thursday, so that was just the start of what would be a frustrating that weekend. Was, that was the beginning of the problems. I think if you would have played the Marlins on – you know, four independent games on four independent days. I think the results might have been slightly different. I don't know about I don't know about game four, but I think they might have been slightly different. Yeah, and game four is the one we were nervous about the entire time. But how about game one on Friday? Uh, Jay, you know, this is the one that we were looking. We wanted to see what Jamo was going to do. Jamison Tyone coming off the IL, and this game was exactly what the Cubs needed to do to this Marlins team all weekend and didn't. They needed some length out of uh, their starter. They got that. They needed the offense to put up some runs so J-Mo wasn't having to pitch high-stress innings. They did that. And on a day that was kind of crazy, really strong wind gusts, the defense played really well. So this was by far the best game of the series. They got off to a quick start, bottom of the first, one out. Nico doubles, Patrick Wisdom walks, and then Cody Bellinger hit one that bounced off the glove of first baseman Josh Bell and ricocheted to right field. Nico scores, and uh, Wisdom was at second. Then Morrell hit into a double play, but Wisdom moved to third. And Dustin, here's where the win played a factor. Swanson yep. hit one that looked like that center fielder Chaz Gisholm would catch, but a last minute wind gust put him away from, uh, pulled it away from his glove, bounced against the wall to make it two to nothing. And with one out in the second, Nick Madrigal was hit by a pitch and scored on a Nico Horner double, 3 nothing. But the big inning comes in the third. Cody Bellinger hits a leadoff single. A.J. Puck walks the next two batters to load the bases for Ian Happ. Happ would strike out, but Garrett Cooper singled to score Morrell and Dansby to increase the lead to 4 to nothing. Nick Madrigal would ground out to score Morrell and make it 5 nothing. And then Miguel Amaya hit a double, and the Cubs' lead was 7 nothing after 3 inning AJ Puck's day was done three innings pitch gave up seven runs on seven hits three walks and four K's Mike Talkman would add an insurance run in the fifth with an RBI single but that is what you do to bad pitchers you knock them right. out of the game jump on them early and uh, Puck is not very good at all and uh, that was uh, that's all the recipe for Jameson Tyone right you put him in a in a nice comfy lead he gets aggressive with the hitters you know, and uh, he had a nice afternoon overall. I mean, and even though it was the fish, fine. But, you know, first outing back, I liked what I saw. Yeah, absolutely. And and this is a graphic from Marquis here. You know, he retired the first 10 bases he faced. He threw first pitch strikes to 17 of 18 batters. Don't be nibbling, right? 10 pitches in the first inning, eight pitches in the second, seven fly ball outs, four ground ball lots, average exit velocity of 86.2. He went five innings pitch, gave up three hits, and earned run a home run to Brian De La Cruz, which was not going to be the last time we heard that. 4K, 73 pitches. So a really good outing for Jamison Tyone. The what number I really like there, Crowley, is the zero in the walk category because that's something that has been an issue uh, across the board for Cubs pitching. Absolutely. And then not only that, but Keegan Thompson went two innings, gave up no runs, no hits, one walk and 4Ks. Colton Brewer finished it up, mop-up duty, two innings pitch. He gave up two runs on three hits. Only one of the runs was earned, but no walks and one K. So you win this one, eight to three. And, you know, what, what you're excited about is you knock Puck out in the third. You, you make him go into their bullpen. You got a lot of, you know, you got 
you only had to use three pitchers on the day. So the only right. negative was that and you've got out. a double header and you've got a double header coming and you know, right. that. like this wasn't right. like a, a shocking double header coming, you know, that the next day you're, you're having a double header. So you've gotten to the Marlins bullpen. Right. And, and then the only negative of the entire game was that Ian Happ left with some hamstring tightness. Well, it's only an issue if he's not back out there. He thinks he'll be back out there Tuesday night. We'll have to wait and see. Right. Now that takes us to game two. Because of the rain out, the original matchup was supposed to be Shodi Managa versus Jesus Lusardo. And this this was a tough one, Dustin. Jesus Lusardo. All right, before we get into the game, hold on. I got a question for a season ticket holder, guy who goes to a lot of games. And I know you said when you started the podcast that you went to uh, mm -hmm. 17 and a half innings of, of baseball. Now, yeah. if this had been – so the game that was played at 120 was the scheduled game. Correct. Okay, so if you had looked ahead earlier in the week, or right, and you saw, oh, Shota Imanaga's pitching Saturday afternoon, and you bought tickets, and then we have a rainout, okay? The rainout is the night game. The, the rain, you don't mess with a game that's already on the books. So the right. Thursday, the Thursday tickets turned into Saturday night tickets. But Correct. then if you bought tickets for Saturday afternoon because you wanted to see Shoda, you didn't get Shoda. And no. I think there's a little right. Am I right about that? I mean, yeah, you're that's correct. not what happened. But I'm saying, as the purchaser of the ticket, as the as the customer and the consumer. If you if you planned that day to go down there to see Shota Imanaga, I feel like you got gypped. I mean that that happens unfortunately. You know when when you have these double headers and rainouts and these these things are going to happen. You you hope that you get to see who you want to see, but but that's how it goes. So maybe you know you could have bought it on the secondary market real cheap to go Saturday night if you wanted to do all eighteen like me. Well, there were I mean listen, yeah, there were plenty of seats, but it wasn't exactly warm on Saturday, and it was even colder Saturday night. I saw you uh, bundled up like you were at a Bears game. Yeah, you got to just put some layers on and have a few beers, and it'll all be all good. Yeah. Uh huh. All right. Well, let's talk about what uh, was good and bad in Game One because there was a little bit of both. Yeah, you know, the good was, uh, you know, Javier Assad, he he pitched well again. He took on Lusardo, but, you know, I was disappointed because Lusardo had been struggling. He had a 0-2 uh, record with a 7.65 ERA, but you wouldn't know that the way he pitched against the Cubs on Saturday. They didn't have their first hit until the third inning. With one out, uh, Canario got his first hit of the game with a little of the game with a little duck snort to right. Nico followed that up with a single up the middle, and then Pee Wiz, Patrick Wisdom got his first hit of the season, a triple that the wind just kept into the park. It hit kind of halfway up the wall. Two runs score, and the Cubs were up two nothing. Unfortunately, that was the only blemish on Lusardo's days. He went six innings pitch, gave up two runs on three hits, three walks, and six Ks. All the runs and hits were in the third inning, nothing else. Right, and so he did exactly what the Marlins needed him to do, which was protect the bullpen that had been overused the day before. Right, and he limited the damage. Again, only one inning where, and, and, and that one hit, the, the Canario hit, like I said, just one of those little cheap bloops off the end of the bat. Uh, but Javier Assad kept his string of good starts going. Uh, looked dicey in the first. Luis Arise hit a double, and then Bryla de la Cruz walked to put two runners on and no out. But Assad got the next two outs before Jesus Sanchez hit a sharp line drive that looked like it would score both runs. But Alexander Canario, don't forget, he was a really good center field as well. He was playing left field that night. He made a fantastic catch to rob Sanchez and end the inning. And then Assad got stronger as the game went on. He shut down the Marlins until the fifth inning when he clearly ran out of gas. And this was frustrating, Dustin, because he walked the first two runners uh, batters he faced. Emmanuel Rivera, who's hitting 207. And Vidal Bruhan, who's hitting point oh eight seven. You sure he doesn't uh, play for the White Sox? Oh, okay. Right, but but you know this is the thing, and we've talked about it with Jordan Wicks, especially, and other things. Is when you face a guy who's batting point oh eight seven, don't nibble. Go right, right. after don't this guy. Cute. Don't don't, right. don't play don't around. Get cute. Right. Totally. Agree. You know. Yep. And so you got those two guys on. He struck out Nick Fortes, but Luis Arise would single to load the bases for Brian De La Cruz. He hits one to the warning track that I think the wind kept in for a sack fly. But again, you just can't walk garbage hitters uh, at the bottom of the order. And then you have to face, you know, uh, Luis Horizon, Brian De La Cruz. They were, you know, that was it for 
uh, Javier Assad, Luke Little, who was called up that day as the team's 27th man because of the double header, came in. He struck out Chaz Gisholm to end uh, the inning. So that ended. And I like I like that, right? I, I like that for Luke Little, right? That was a it wasn't a super high leverage situation, but it was a little bit of a high leverage situation, right? So that was, yeah. I think, a good. I think that was a good learning moment, unlike the last time we saw Luke Little in there. Right, Luke did a great job, and and then uh, you know he pitched one inning with one K and one walk. Then Yancy Almonte came in for one point one innings. He didn't allow a base runner with one K. Dustin, this takes us to the eighth, where things kind of get a little bit controversial. Mark Leiter came out of the pen. The first he got the first two batters out before he gave a back to back single. And then Council decided to go to Adbert Alzali, who's been struggling all season, for the four-out save. Uh, that that a lot of Cup fans were not happy with that. I, I don't understand that one little bit. Not not one, not one little bit. The first time you are going to have an opportunity to save a ball game, and you're going to go right back to him again. I'm not saying that he should be put on, you know, Cubs Island and never be allowed to pitch in a high leverage situation again. But the very first time that you're back in that situation and then you ask him for a four out save, I just don't, I don't get it. And I don't understand that what really bothers me is after the game, council's not asked directly, Craig, please take me through the four out save for Adbert Alzale. The, the right. question is very simple. I, I don't, I don't get it. I don't, I and mean, we're going to hear from Craig Council and, and hear his reaction to certain things, but I, I I was absolutely flabbergasted by that. No, I agree. I was hoping we'd have some sort of audio clip explaining all of that, and, and we got nothing. So we we you know that was that was bizarre. He's struggling. Give him a clean inning and let him let him get it done. Let him get the three out save. You know, uh, Lighter's been great all year. Unfortunately, like I said, gave up the back to back singles. And so for lighter, and that brought in Alzali, and he walked the first battery face. And Emmanuel. that's the other part about it. He walks the first guy he faces to load the bases. Right. And that's a guy in Emmanuel Rivera who has a 207 average. That's Again. what I'm saying. I mean, come on. Now he, he's, he's sitting there. He gets Vidal Bruhan to end the inning. And, and so then he comes back out in the ninth. He gets the first out of the inning before Luis Arias single. And then Brian De La Cruz hit one 397 feet to left center to put the Marlins up three to two. Now, here's the thing, Dustin, where I sit, my seats are right almost their first row upper deck. And I, I'm looking at, I'm right by third base. So I see the guys coming in and I see Alzali and he just starts screaming into his glove takes his glove when he walks down the stairs and chucks it against the wall. And then the next thing I see is a couple coaches surrounding him. And I don't know anything else that happened. Yeah, I, I mean, I was, was upset either. too. If I, if I had something to throw, I would have thrown it as well. I, you know, and, and here's the other thing overall, like feel free to walk Luis arise, right? Like feel free. I know that he would have been on base for De La Cruz's home run, but it just like, feel free. He, he, like all the guy does is hit like all that guy does. Is hit, 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 hit. So feel free. Right. Uh, he, uh, he doesn't hit for power in Europe. You, you know, you don't want to put him on base because he can also steal bases and stuff like that. I I don't have a problem with that. The problem is, is that Alzali has been struggling, uh, especially, you know, a lot of his pitches aren't getting the break that they did last year, the, that extra bite. And so, you know, the Cubs weren't finished. Tanner Scott came in to close it out. Mike Talkman and Nick Magical hit back-to-back -back singles. And then Dustin Miguel Amaya lays down a beautiful bunt to put runners at second and third with one out. I'm not the biggest fan of the bunt, but that was a nice but one. That's when you bunt. I mean, that that's that's when you bunt. So you got the tying run 90 feet from home, and, and the how many outs? And how many outs, Crowley? One out. That's very important, by the way. Very important for where I'm going to go here. But go ahead. You got the winning run at second. Alexander Canario struck out and Nico Horner grounded out and the Cubs were stunned learning, losing the first half of the twin bill three to two. Does anybody on the Cubs staff have a moment with Alexander Canario? Like, and say, Hey son, listen, the tying run is 90 feet away. The winning run is 180 feet away. You don't need to be swinging out of your shoes and trying to put one into the Lake Michigan. I mean, it, it wasn't a soft, this is not a softball game. What's the approach? You know, this is, this is where like the great Craig council, like 
Did they? I mean, again, I don't know if they did, and he just can't listen. But where's the approach? I mean, the, the Cubs batters have had a great approach overall so far this season. But like right. that guy, I mean, I, when they get somebody healthy, Crowley, that guy needs to go back down and learn. I, I, he's he's scary in left field. He is scary in left field. When he and Hap's back, that's for you know, that's the corresponding move. He he is not ready. I know he can hit the ball a ton, but like I mean, that was just a poor poor approach. And you wonder too, though, you know, maybe you get Jan Gomes to hit in that situation. Sure, I mean, you feel free. I mean, feel right. free to pinch hit too, right? But I'm just saying, it, it, can he not take like? Can he not take some instruction? Can he not take some coaching? Well, it was frustrating for sure. And when we talk about frustration in that game, Al Edward Alzlai has pitched 10 innings. He's given up 10 hits, five earned runs, four home runs, four blown saves. So almost half the hits he's allowed has been home runs. And then you got to uh, sit there and wait for four hours to get the bad taste out of your mouth or at least try. Well, that's why I went to output to get some wings and some beers. It got the taste out. But um, yeah. I could tell you that. So when you look at this, you got four blown saves when you combine the end of March, early April for Edward Alzali, Dustin, he had three blown saves in all of 2023. So that, that right now is a big, big problem. Well, he's and definitely letting Jed and Carter down, right? He, I mean, they, they have, they have shown faith in him and this is how he's paid them back. Not yeah. good. And, 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 you know, he wants to do well and that's the, first oh, sure. I'm not saying he's like thinking, I'm not saying he's doing it on purpose, but I just don't understand the, the thought process of giving him the ball in a four out save. And then how about this? So he walks the guy. I'm not saying you go pull him that, but he gets out of it and he's clearly frustrated. You gave us a great, you know, advantage point from where you sit at the games. And we don't know what was said between him and the coaches. How about get somebody up at that point? The bullpen is not taxed and you have your ACE going in four hours and show to Imanaga. How about going to somebody else at that point? I think that, you know, the next guy you would have up would have been Hector Neris. Oh, and, and, and wow. Really? The guy, the guy who did it as a world champion with the Astros. Hmm. And then as we go through game two, look who he gives the ball to. Oh, Hector Neris. Why wouldn't you do that in game one? But my Why guess is, is that, that they, they wanted to use one guy as a closer in the first game and one guy as a closer in the second would be my guess. They picked the wrong one. At the wrong Alzelay's got to get the job done too. I mean, well, he's got to get the job done. That, there's that's all, there's, about a, bunch as guys, as there's a bunch of guys in that pen right now. It, it, out Again, he's, he, he being Craig Council, keeps talking about outgetters. We, we, we need outgetters. I want outgetters. So don't give me the save crap. Outgetters. Outgetters. Well, we, the Cubs turned to show to get some outs in game three of the twin bill of the doubleheader there. So, you know, they needed a win and the Cubs nice had Shodim Naga nice on the mound and, and the Marlins uh, called up starter Rodri Munoz, who had a 1097 ERA in AAA to start the season. He was a 27th man for the Marlins. He gives up a solo home run to Cody Bellinger in the first to put the Cubs up one nothing. that, you know, Cody in the first game got his 2023 silver slugger award. Uh, before game one of the doubleheader. But then after walking the next batter, Munoz sat down the next 14 Cubs he faced, Dustin. So you give up a home run, you get a walk in the first inning, and then nothing for, for the next 14 batters on a guy called up from AAA with almost 11 ERA. Right. He looked like uh, he was uh, you know, pitching his heart out looking for a, a trade to a contender or something. Shota Imanago is pitching well, but in the top of the fourth with one out, Josh Bell reached on a fielding error on Nico Horner, who was playing short for the game. Tim Anderson's doubled the score Bell, but it was still an unearned run. The game was tied at one. Shota's ERA was still 0.00. .00. Unfortunately, that didn't last long as Chaz Gisenholm singled with the Met. Uh, Marlins took a 2-1 to one lead, and that was the first earned run given up by Shota in four starts. Keep that keep yeah. that to memory, right, for your trivia someday at, uh, at Cubs kind of Crowley. I'll have it locked in there, but he got <laughs> Avi Sale Garcia to ground out into a double play to end the threat. Top of the six, Josh Bell hit a solo home run, and the Cubs were down three to one. Showed have finished the game going 6.1 innings pitch. He gave up five hits, three runs, two of them earned no walks and five Ks. So the Cubs are down, though, three to one, and Rodri Munoz is cruising in the sixth inning. Alexander Canario hit a leadoff home run, uh, solo home run, and Muñoz's night was over. He went five innings pitch, gave up two runs, two hits, both solo homers, one walk, and seven Ks. 
So the guy gives up only two hits, but they're both home runs. Right. Anthony Bender came in. He gave up singles to Nico and Christopher Morrell. A wild pitch would move the runners to second and third. And then Michael Bush singled the drive in two runs. Cubs take a four to three lead. Go, uh, Bush advanced to second on a throw home, and he made he scored when Garrett Cooper singled to make it five to three. No bullpen meltdowns this time. Ben Brown went two innings, gave up no runs, two hits, three Ks. Hector Neris came to close it. He gave up one. He gave up one hit with one K and the Cubs bounce back to take the nightcap of the doubleheader. Bush was two for four with two RBIs and solo home runs by Bellinger and Canario led the offense, but it was just a different looking offense than what we saw on Friday. Well, I'm not quite sure why Michael Bush needed the day off. He's 26 years old. He's making his, you know, debut in the big leagues, you know, as a regular everyday player. And then this is how we use Ben Brown. Huh? Like, I, I that's how they decided to use Ben Brown. I, I, I just, I, I don't get it. I, I'm confused. If Ben Brown is going to be used out of the pen, then Crowley, you could have, you could have sold me on Ben Brown following lighter in game one. You could have sold me on that, given him the chance to get the last out in the eighth and then decide based on how he did in that situation, whether or not you wanted to go to Alzale in the ninth, but like Ben Brown and almost like, kind of cleanup duty at that point, like mop up duty. Well, I mean, it was, it was still a pretty close game at that point. I mean, you're talking five to three, it's only a two run game. So I know I, I mean, just, I just felt like I just feel there's more to Ben Brown than that. I just, I just felt it was weird. And I think if you ask the question, Oh, why Ben Brown at that point? Well, he was scheduled to do a bullpen. We needed to get him up there. We needed to have him throw. Okay. I, I, I just, to, I don't know. Me, I just, it, it's frustrating. I, I feel like, I feel like the Cubs should definitely have two, at least two more wins than they have right now. If I hadn't watched any games this season, and I've watched almost every game except the West Coast ones, and you told me where they were in the standings and what their record was right now based on who they were starting the season playing, I'd have been happy. But that's not how it works. I've watched the games. I've analyzed games. Talked the games with, with you at least twice a week. Talk about Cubs baseball five days a week on the Mully and Haw show. And this is this is a team that should have at least – two more wins than they have right now two okay um so you know i think if i'm going with ben brown i think that was an interesting spot to put him in he's going to be a guy that if they use him out of the bullpen it's going to be for two or three innings i don't think they want him to go for one inning or you know in that spot you're talking about with mark Leiter, that was you know with two outs in the eighth inning i think they want him to throw multiple innings and stay stretched out in case they need him um, I, I'm just, the only thing I would say is maybe you, you, you know, I think they really wanted that win and I trust Ben Brown more than I trust Drew Smiley. So I, so that's where I think. Okay, right. I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not saying I don't disagree with that either, but I just, I just got, I'm just ticked off Crowley that they gave, uh, Alzley a, a four out save opportunity on the heels of what happened last time he had the ball. That that's the big thing I think I, when you walk away for this weekend. You know, there, I I can I can counter with all your complaints right now. The one I can't is that I, that I don't have an explanation for. All right, about. let's move to game four, Crowley. That's fine. <laughs> let's talk about the professor. He uh, was in need of a, a good afternoon, and the Cubs needed it if they wanted to win the series. Yeah, Dustin, we, we talked about how Kyle had to face some tough teams in Texas and, and San Diego and the Dodgers. This was a team that, you you know, you would you hoped he would really kind of have a good game with. And it was a better-ish game. We found out before the game that Alzali would not be closing the game. And that, oh, oh, really? you know, they're oh, going to. Wow. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. Thanks. Gosh. They're going to try to work Thank his way God back. we got you rule. down from the, we got you past the cheddar curtain. Thank goodness. Wow, that's an awesome – wow, I knew that, you know, we're not going to give him the ball on Sunday. Mm, thank you. So we know that. Now, so as, as Hendricks tries to get off the schneid, he had some good innings. First inning, he went one, two, three. Cubs had a chance to get on the board when Nico hit a leadoff double and Bellinger walked, but they left him stranded. That came to bite the Cubs as Jesus yeah. Sanchez crushed a home run 460 feet to center field, and the Cubs trailed one nothing. The Cubs came back in the second with one out. Michael Talkman, quote, doubled. Chaz Gisholm is a great player, but uh, he's not a great center fielder. That ball should have been caught. Uh, Amaya walked and Canario struck out, but Nico had a clutch two-out single to tie the game. He's had five multi-hit games this week. Bellinger walked to load the bases, but Christopher Morrell struck out to end the threat. 
Hendricks ran into trouble in the fourth. The Marlins hit four singles in a row on four pitches to make it three to one. Emmanuel Rivera grounded into a force out to make it four to one. Cubs answered back in the bottom of the inning. Talkman hit a hard single. Amaya just missed a home run. But then Canario hit a bloop single. Horner hit a bloop double. And then it was four to two. Then Bellinger hit a bloop single. So all of these, it looked like there's a lot of balls lost in the sun on this one. And so the Cubs pulled within a run four to three. They had an opportunity to tie, but Morell hit one right to third on the contact play. Emmanuel Rivera threw out Nico at home, and then Michael Bush grounded out to end the threat. In Hendricks' last start, Council waited one inning too long. He wasn't going to make that mistake. Drew Smiley came into the game in the fifth inning. Hendricks only went four innings pitch, gave up four runs on six hits, no walks, and five Ks, gave up that monster home run. Unfortunately for Drew, his defense let him down. Luis Arise hit a, a double, a leadoff double that, you know, it looked like, you know, and then Brian De La Cruz hit a one out to Cody Bellinger that he lost in the sun. So that ball landed right next to him. It counts as a single. So now you got runners at the corner. Chaz Gisholm singled on a ball that Dansby lost in the sun. So two balls lost in the sun. So a run would come around to score. It's five to three. Smiley got Josh Bell to fly out and Jesus Sanchez grounded into a double play. The Marlins would score one more run against Smiley. He would go 2.1 innings and give up those two runs on four hits. Alzali pitched a scoreless eighth, looked good. 1K, and then Keegan Thomas Keegan Thompson finished the ninth. But Dustin, the Cubs offense that we talked about on Saturday looked so bad, just had a lot of chances, couldn't cash him in. That Nico Horner double in the first, couldn't cash it in. Yeah, wasted, bottom of the, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, bottom of the six, Miguel Amaya reached second on an on a air, and the throw went away, so he got on to second, couldn't cash that in. Christopher Mel- Morell hit a leadoff double in the seventh, couldn't cash that in. They had three runs on eight hit, Dustin, but three for 16 with runners in scoring position, and they left nine runners on base. Yeah, those are killer, absolute killer, killer numbers. So some uh, final thoughts here on the uh, four-game series. Dustin, I know everyone wants to pile on Kyle Hendricks. I understand it. Um, Adbert Alzali, we bl- we brought it up, four blown saves. Christopher Morrell and Dansby Swanson have looked really, really bad. We'll get to the hots and the knots, but, but, but these two guys, just in general. Up. Yep. I Ice mean, cold. you cannot have Christopher Morrell going three for 20, batting 150 in, in the cleanup spot. No. He's slashing 150, 308, 200. Dansby Swanson's your highest paid player. He's five for his last 20. So he's batting 250, which is at least a little better. Um, but but it, it's, you know, Morrell's a guy that's hot and cold, and you can't just let him continue to be cold in the, in the, in the fourth spot. If he's cold, knock him down to six or seven. Exactly until right. he heats back up. That's the problem I got here. Exactly right. Now, the Probably, Kyle, do, you give, do you give Hendricks the ball again in a starting spot next time? Here's through? the thing I'm going to say. I listened to the Mully Haw, and, and, and I got to hear my buddy Kevin from Palatine. I got to hear everybody <laughs> give their opinion. All good, man. Here's what I'm going to tell you real quick, okay? They are not going to – there's no going to be a fake injury. You do that, they just banned the GM – from the Mets for one year for doing that last year for faking injuries. You can't do that. You can't send him to Iowa. He has more than five years service time. And so that's not going to happen. You're not going to trade him because nobody wants him right now with an 11 ERA. What you got to do is, is him and Tommy Hadovy and Miguel Amaya, who's been catching him. They're going to keep working and try to get this out. They are going to give Kyle Hendricks every, they're not going to eat $16 million. That's no, not, I'm not going to happen. That. No, mm-mm. you're I'm not, not going to have a guy. I'm not suggesting DFA in him. No, you're not going to have a guy who has control issues and has given up a ton of contact in the bullpen. That's the last thing you want to see him coming out of, and that's not a place that he's familiar with coming out of. So right now, you're going to have to. Kyle's going to have to grind, and they're going to give him opportunities until at least Justin Steele is ready to go, no. and then they'll make right. an opportunity. So we got some time here. Three, four starts at least. Before, if if this is the same, if we're having this same conversation after three, four more starts, then you do have to take a look and say, okay, maybe it's time that we got to do something that's really difficult that we don't want to do, which would be DFA. That's your only option. He's not going in the bullpen. He's not going to Iowa. He's not getting traded, and he's not having a fake injury. You are listening to the Fly the W670 podcast. This is season three. It's episode 33. Cubs flounder against the fish. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. And hey, leave us a five-star review if you don't mind. In this segment, 
Crowley interviews Shahad of Sharma, Cubs beat writer for The Athletic, on the troubles plaguing the professor and what the next steps are for the Cubs vet. Got to take the positives again and progress, you know. Just uh, got beat like five pitches in a row there. First pitch, hunting, um, mostly fastballs there. But still executed a lot mentally, more aggressive on the glove. Just, yeah, put us in a bad spot again. We had to win that game take that series there so a lot of disappointments but I got to still got to focus on the positives the mental approach that I took out there and executing on the glove was better it's a results-based game so it's obviously not good on that end but got to take the positives in the right direction um just got to put it together here mechanics feel good you know it's more intent based it comes mentally when I'm when locked on the glove and aggressive the mechanics sync up they're on time when the thoughts kind of just aren't like that then that's when I'm missing but today, a lot more aggressive, a lot on the glove, bad contact, limping slug for the most part. When you're not getting the results, giving up runs, like I said, that's a game we had to had to get. So, no, no, nothing on that decision there. I got to be better and prove it to get those opportunities. Honestly, I'd rather just be back out there tomorrow, <laughs> pitch again tomorrow. You want to just do it more, get more reps, and just get past this as, as quick as possible. Joining me now on the Fly of the W podcast, I am glad to have the Cubs beat writer for the Athletics, Sahadev Sharma. Sahadev, how are we doing today? I'm doing well. How about you? Uh, I'm I'm doing okay. I think I've, I'm 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 feeling pretty balanced. I know people are very panicky about Kyle Hendricks, which is why I wanted to have you on. I got to tell you, Sahadev, you know, after his start against Arizona, it looked to me like Kyle was shell shocked, like he just didn't have answers. After the post game this time, which we just heard some of those comments, he seemed more himself, more in control of things. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. It, it, he was encouraged by some things from that start. It, what I wrote and what I feel just watching that start was, you know, if if we'd seen Hendricks look somewhat like himself to start this season. It, this would have just been like, ah, that's a throwaway one, one bad pitch, right? That got launched, obviously 460 feet, but then the rest was, you know, he got dinked and dunked, which is going to happen to him. And it's going to happen to him when he's right. It happens like what? Once every five starts or so where it's just like, ah, that stinks. Oh, that's too bad. Oh, that one found a hole. Uh, and, and that happened to him in the fourth inning. And it's at a point right now where Craig council wasn't going to, you know, give him a longer leash to go five, six, seven innings, even though uh, he only had, I believe, like 53 or 54 pitches at that point in time. So it was one of those things where you'd like to have seen much better results against that team as well. So there were there, like in context, it's just not it, it make it doesn't make you feel any better that this was a step forward. It feels like, oh, man, what is, you know, that's not great. You don't want this to be a step forward. But it, it was with considering where he was and where he's been this season. Um, I, I don't rule out that he can't find himself, that he can't be a effective starter for them. But it, it's it's getting to a point where you need to see the results, right? You have to see it. And it doesn't matter if there was bad luck involved. It's just it's time for uh, a good start to build some confidence for everyone and to kind of you know, give them a chance to to string a few together. Otherwise, you know, every every bad start that comes from now on, it's the, the questions mount, uh, you know, especially with Justin Steele not that far away from returning. Yeah, Justin Steele threw a, a bullpen at Wrigley the other day, going to go out to Arizona and, 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 you know, pitch a little bit in the uh, – in the air in the uh, Arizona complex league, but then, you know, you got to figure he's going to have a start in the uh, minor league somewhere soon, but you brought up the fact that, you know, Hendricks has given up eight home runs and the rest of the Cubs pitching staff has given up 15. Like that's just an eye popping number right there. Yeah. And you know what? Like when he's right, it, you know, home runs can still bite him occasionally. Right. But not to that extent. Uh, so you, what what is this? Is this just like bad luck? Fly balls going uh, a little too you know a little too often over the fence. Uh, there's a lot of numbers that you look at that you're like, that's not going to last. That can't last. Uh, left on base percentage is like fifty percent. That's not that, that's really bad luck, right? The BABIP is really high, but he's also just like it, there. It's just happening too often where he's getting lined up right where where, where the, he's not missing the barrel. Um, 
I, I see flashes of the Hendricks that we know. I, I just haven't seen it for five, six innings in his start. So when you see it every other inning or once one batter, you know, depending on the start, he's had some truly awful starts. I thought the Dodgers start was kind of okay. I thought uh, the Marlins start was okay. Uh, I, I think maybe my biggest question is even if he's right right now, can he face a lineup a third time through? So what what does that mean if he can't, right? I, I know he can't face like the Braves and the Dodgers a third time through. I don't think you can do that uh, unless he starts incorporating the curveball a lot more. Uh, but I, I don't I don't know how exactly it works if he's going to be, um, you know, basically unusable a third time through. Uh, he, like he couldn't go a third time through against the Marlins. Again, That that's just not a lineup that – we should be having th- that type of discussion about he should be able to get, you know, a few outs the third time through. And it, I'm sure that was a factor as well. And why uh council pulled him at that point. I guess the one, you know, when you talk about looking for signs of encouragement and I'm kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel here it, to me, it looked like there was, you know, his pitches, there was a couple in, in previous starts that were just uncompetitive pitches. Like guys are just spitting on him, not even flinching. I felt like this time wasn't as bad and and you saw, like you said, couple. It was like every other inning was good, and then not so great. But it seems like he's having trouble when he goes, you know, glove side. As far as it just kind of leaking over the plate, is that something that he's talked about at all? Yeah, I mean, for him, he needs to be a uh, good glove side, right? Like he, it's uh, there's there's both like he down and away is a big thing for him. So so arm side for him, right? Uh, down and away. Oh wait, now I'm 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 like turning myself around <laughs> down in the way to righty. So exactly. Yeah. So, so glove side uh, is, is important for him. That's how he kind of sets himself up. Everything works off of that. You know, certain pitchers like that's what, that's like the traditional thing, right. For, for pitchers, it, it's completely changed now. That does that's not how uh, most pitchers work anymore. Like, uh, but get like establishing down in the way and then working from there, everything kind of plays off that. Uh, I mean, that probably has to do with uh, like the little mechanical things. He said it's he's I think he's focusing on the mental aspect and then the mechanics come in line when when he does that. But there's absolutely some mechanical things that he's working on. Um, there, there are a lot of little small things. It sounds like his arm is a little um, a little behind. Right. Or a little slow. However, you want to want to phrase it, which means there's some something something's moving too quickly. He may be moving forward, like falling towards the plate and he needs to kind of stay back in his delivery uh, at the top of his delivery. He kind of needs to make sure he's really staying on his back leg and, and not drifting forward uh, that that can kind of throw things off. I know that was, that's been an issue in the past. Uh, one thing I found interesting was uh, after not this most recent start, or maybe it was, it was sometime before this most recent start and in between like in between starts where council kind of said sometimes, you know, it, he does have bad marches in April's, right? He's, he's, he's not great. It's some of these guys that rely, especially on command. Uh, it can take them a while to lock in their, their uh, delivery, which can me- lead to April being a rough month. Uh, I, I'd never really thought about that, uh, that aspect of it, of why April is bad, but maybe maybe that has something to do with it. Again, uh, he has to, like, he can't be this bad, first of all. It can't be this bad if, if it's going to take him a little while. And also, it's, again, we need to see results uh, to feel good about any of it. It's just, it's too, it's too poor to, to continue to make excuses. And I think another big issue that, you know, Kyle really hasn't, I mean, we haven't seen Kyle pitch like this, you know, a little bit in 2022 before the arm injury and we knew something was wrong. Right. Um, but you know, now you have all these young kids, you know, knocking at the door. We've seen what Ben Brown has done. You know, Jordan Wicks is in the rotation and, and you wonder how much longer they're going to keep Kate Horton down. So it just seems like the pressure's on that we have these kids and, and, and every fifth day, this is almost like a guaranteed loss. Yeah. You know, I mean, he kept them, I shouldn't say he kept them in that game, but he, 
he the the offense should it should have been better right mm-hmm. against the Marlins. You should hope for more than three runs against the Marlins. It's not it's not like the Mar the the offense <laughs> lit it up. It, it'd be nice if the offense could have kind of carried him through a, a couple more of these starts. I think they got him through the. I think he's the one one game that he started the Dodgers game. Is that right? Um, it, but other than that, I, I don't think they've they've won any of his starts. Did they did they win that start, uh, or was that one of the was that the one game they lost to the Dodgers? I can't remember off the top of my head. I feel like they won that one. Uh, but yeah, like it does get to a point where, I, and I think that's what this like leash is until Steele comes back. Right, we have a few starts here to to watch and see if the Marlins outing was a real step forward. Was that? A moment you can take away and say, "Okay, he figured some things out, and bad luck bit bit him, and now he he can kind of progress forward and and uh, do some things." He's he's got a Red Sox lineup that isn't that daunting, but it's always tough to pitch in Fenway, right? Um, and then uh, what's after that? Uh, he's going to face the Mets, who are who are playing well now. So. Yeah, we'll see. Next two starts, I think, are important. Every start is important for him going forward. You're right, Ben Brown. Like I, I really like Ben Brown in the bullpen. I think he's going to be a huge piece for them in the bullpen uh, this season. And like he, need, he, if needed, he can make starts, right? But I, I like him as a bullpen arm this season for mostly because you can kind of control his innings that way. He can do multi innings. He's, I think, his max is 104 in. The season he got traded to the Cubs, I think he had 104 innings total. So, uh, is that 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 gives me a little bit of pause uh, as to like making him a starter full time this season? Because if if he's going to be up in the big leagues, which he should be, he's good enough to be up in the big leagues. You need to make sure he's there all season, and I think he's going to be a big piece of the bullpen. I agree. Like all those other names you mentioned, like Wicks, like he deserves to be in the rotation. Assad deserves to be in the rotation. Wicks, I guess you could debate. You know, the the, the right. starts haven't been great. I I like his stuff this year. He, I feel like the stuff is ticked up. So I, I like him, and I think you know you want to see him eating more innings, but uh, there's there's positives there. Um, certainly, it, we have this window of time until Justin Steele, assuming no setbacks. Uh, is back in the rotation to to kind of evaluate things. And I think that's the best way to look at it. Now, in that post-game conference, he really talked up Miguel Amaya, and he's not the only one um, as far as pitch selection. And, and you know, his. I, I always think his framing is just phenomenal. But, you know, I know that Kyle, after the injury, was kind of calling his own games with the pitch com. Is now it sounded in the post game interview he wasn't doing that as much. Do you know like it, how much Amaya has a say in, in the pitches that are called, or is it being called from the uh, bull, the dugout, or yeah. is it still Hendricks? It sounds like Amaya's calling games for Hendricks now. Uh, I, I think that started a couple starts ago, maybe not, maybe two starts now. He, he's been doing that. Um, and uh, Hendricks's point was basically like, yeah, he's. He needs more input in general, right? He he needs to like failure kind of led to him reevaluating things, and that was one of one of them. And uh, and he he said like if he's convicted on a pitch, he'll he'll let let Amaya know like I, I'm going with this. But uh, for the most part, he's trusting Amaya and and letting him kind of lead the way. So just to make things clear, because I get the questions all the time. Number one, like you said, th- until Steele comes back, Kyle's going to be getting starts. He's going to be given a chance because, in a way, he's kind of earned that as far as the years he's put into the team and what he's kind of meant to the organization. They're not going to DFA him and his $16 million after four starts. Yeah, I mean, like fans love to to react in a way that it's like, get rid of this guy, <laughs> right? Council thinks a lot like a front office, right? And, and like, and, and Jed will think similarly. Uh, like, they're they need the depth, right? They need to get him right because once he's gone, once you DFA him, that's a that's you're losing depth now, okay? And if he like if he gets picked up by someone else and he gets on his normal Kyle Hendricks role, you're going to be kicking yourself, saying you know we should have given him two more starts. Now, like at a certain point, you have to make that decision. Four starts for someone that doesn't have options as a veteran and has a long history of success and success in an odd way that, you know, like this type of if something is off like this, where his command is off, like at least there's an explanation. You can kind of say like, oh, okay, his commands off. 
um, he that's something he can fix. If he if he was throwing 84, 85, you'd say like, whoa, what's wrong here? Is he healthy? OK, he's healthy. This isn't going to work. Right. Doesn't matter like the command. Right. Like at a certain point, that's just that there's a, you know, too small a margin of error there. Uh, so, yeah, I think it makes sense to give him some time. Uh, pitching like this doesn't really like like you said before, it doesn't really give the team a chance to win. So there is a point in time where you're going to have to make a tough decision and it may end up being a wrong quote unquote wrong decision in the sense like he may get picked up by someone, you know, clear waivers, elect for free agency, sign a league minimum deal somewhere and, and be better, right. Be usable. That's, that's a possibility. Uh, but yeah, I think there are reasons to give him a little bit uh, more time because you mentioned all that depth, but it kind of ends after the names you mentioned, and they're not going to call up Cade Horton right now and have him start. Like he, he also needs to. I mean, they'll they're saying they're not going to monitor him strictly on innings, but I mean, he can't pitch 160. I'd be surprised if he's going to go 160, 180, or something like that, right? Not that many pitchers do that, anyways. But uh, at a certain point, like okay, after that, who who are we talking about, right? Who's in the minors right now, other than Horton, that you want in the rotation? Like, I I don't know who that person is. So so th it's not like there's a ton of options outside of the guys that we know are there that are already on the major league roster, Steele and Horton at some point. So I, I like their depth, but to the this point, it, it, it's, you know, the I, I don't think you want to take away from it. And just to make it clear, because I keep getting the, you know, give him the fake injury. Billy Epler just got banned from New from the Mets. He just got banned for a year from baseball. They're not doing the fake injury thing. And, and they're not going to send him to Iowa because he also has, uh, you know, because of the amount of time he spent, he can turn that assignment down. You can't you you can't just send a guy down anyways, right. even if they want to. Even if the guy says, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to. He doesn't have any options. It's like he can't be sent down. I'll, I'll double check that. But I mean, uh, I don't think he can like he'd have to clear waivers and then agree to be sent down. Right. right. So you'd have right. to waive him uh, and then he he clears and then he instead of electing free agency, he takes the uh, being sent down to triple A. It, it's not as easy as, as just saying like, hey. Do you want to go down? Uh, right. It, it's it, like so his options aren't even applicable because at a certain point, like it's it's not like he ran out of options. It's just at a certain point when you're a veteran, you don't have options anymore. That's not how it works. Right. After right? five so, years of service time. Yeah. So and and the fake and the fake injury. Yeah, you, you absolutely can't do that. Um, well, first of all, like you can't force a guy to do the fake injury thing the player has to agree to it first of all right like that's why uh, in general i'll address something that i know fans complain about why didn't they put him on the il why did like you just wasted you you have a short bench for three games and then you put him on the il the player has to agree to it right if the play unless there's like a break or like a tear or something very clearly like this you can't play through this like the player has to say like okay i'm good with it and Yes, you can push them to do it. You can, but then you're you're hurting relationships. You're like there. There's a lot of reasons why that happens. Why you don't see, uh, you know, like the immediate IL. You need to massage the relationship with the player and let them believe that they okay. You you think you can work through this? Here's a couple days to get through this. Okay, now the the max you have is three because that's the furthest they can backdate right so so there's a there, there there are reasons why that doesn't happen and yeah they're not like if he's hurt if there's something that's bugging him right legitimately bugging him and he says like yeah my you know normally i wouldn't go on the il for this but you know my knee hurts or whatever right and then you could do that sure but it, it's yeah it's not as easy it's as not people as easy. make it when they when they call into sports radio um so how did the article is called for kyle hendricks a small step forward still isn't good enough you can find it at the at the athletic and I, I i already subscribed to the athletic but you guys are always having great deals and to me it's some of the best writing and so where can our listeners other than the athletic where can they find your work on the socials 
Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, on, on Twitter at Sahadev Sharma is, uh, is where I'm mostly at. I, I, I got all those other accounts, but I don't really use them. You know, wh- whatever else is out there, I have them, but I don't, you're not going to find me out there very often. But yeah, that's the best place to, to find me on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it nowadays. Well, I appreciate you kind of coming in here, giving us some balance so that people kind of move a little bit off the ledge. And again, Kyle, in my opinion, has earned at least the opportunity to try to write the ship. And, and I appreciate you jumping out. And Crawley, I'll say this. If you're if you're panicked, the Cubs aren't playing well. They're not. They're not playing that well. And they're still what what what's their record? 13 and 8, 13 and 9. Yeah, they're it, on pace for 95 wins. <laughs> it, they're going to play. They're a better team than what we've seen. They're going to play better defense. The offense will be more consistent. Uh, the biggest thing, if you're worried about something, just worry about like injuries piling up. The, like the actual play, like what they've done, like. I'm, they're going to play cleaner baseball. They're going to play better baseball. So to be able to play poorly and come out like this, that's actually a little bit of a good sign. You just hope it turns. You hope they start playing cleaner baseball. You hope they get healthy. That that would be, I, I think they, as, assuming they get healthy and stay healthy, when the like young kids start coming up, the trade deadline, it's going to be, like I, I have optimism for this team. I, I've felt all along that this is a good, well-built team that, should get a lot better at the deadline. I 100% agree, and thank you so much for jumping on, Sadaf. Yep, thanks for having me. Take care. This is Season 3, Episode 33 of the Fly the W670 Podcast. Don't forget to leave Crowley and I one of those five-star reviews. Cubs, mediocre at best against the Marlins. All right, Crowley, I heard there's been some good news in the Central as the uh, Pirates have been swept two series in a row. Yeah, we knew that wasn't going to last. And again, I know people are frustrated. It was a frustrating series. Again, imagine being me, you know, sitting there for 18 innings in the freezing cold. I get it. I get the frustration. But if you look at the standings, the Brewers at 14 and 6, the Cubs are 13 and 9. They're two games back. Cincinnati is starting to pick it up 12 and 9, 2.5 games back. Pittsburgh, like you said, swept. They're at 11 and 11, and we will never shed tears for the Cardinals down in the basement at 9 and 13, six games back. So, the, you know, the, when, when you're looking at this right here, Dustin, it's you're still in a good place. You've, you, you're, you've had crap from Hendricks. You've had four blown saves. You've lost Seiya Suzuki. You lost Justin Steele on day one. Ian Happ didn't go for the whole series, and you were a man down on your bench because of that. Uh, it's, you're, it's not the end of the world right now. I know there's frustration, but at this point in time, you, you got to like where the Cubs are in general on paper. Yes, I do. All right, Crowley, let's talk about some rosters and injury news. Um, before that series started against the fish, it was great to see Patrick wisdom back up with the big league club. Miles Masterboni sent to Iowa. Uh, our guy, Luke little called back up for the double header. That was great to see. We talked about earlier Ian Happ leaving the game Friday night with a little bit of hamstring tightness. He did say yesterday at the ballpark that with the day off today, Monday, he hopes to be back out there on Tuesday with the uh, Astros in town. If anything, maybe a DH him that day, uh, or he's a pinch hitter. Justin Steele, this is the big news, Crowley. Justin Steele threw a live BP at Wrigley on Sunday, and now he's going to do three innings on Friday out in Arizona, and how he comes out of that will be a big indicator on where his future is. And, of course, say a Suzuki doing a little light baseball activity over at the friendly confines as well. So pretty good news uh, overall on the uh, injury front. And now come the Astros, who you know, a lot of people thought would be you know right back there again, and they have been uh, struggling. So let's, uh, let's preview the Astros coming to town. Yeah, it was a wild season last year for the Astros. They were in a three-way battle for a playoff spot with the Mariners and the Rangers last year. They didn't clinch a playoff spot, Dustin, until the last weekend of the season, September 30th, and they clinched the AL West on October 1st, the last day of the regular season. They finished with a record of 90 and 72. The weird thing, Dustin, about the Astros, when I was looking at the numbers of 2023, they were three games under 500 at home and 19 games over 500 on the road. So, you know, usually the old adage goes is, you know, win at home and then be 500 on the road, you're fine. The Astros went the opposite way. They took on the Twins in the ALDS to reach their seventh consecutive ALCS series. Dustin, the Astros lost in the ALCS for, to the eventual world champion Rangers in seven games. 
Former Cub manager Dusty Baker retired after the end of the season. See ya. Uh, the Cubs played the Astros in Houston, if you remember, last season in the middle of May. They were swept. In the first game, Cody Bellinger injured his knee, making a great catch in center. Talkman comes up, and that's kind of the start of how the Cubs kind of start to turn it around there. In the second game, Justin Steele was ill and had one of his worst games of the season. And in the third game, the Cubs were up 6-1 to one in the eighth before the pen gave up two runs in the eighth and walked it off with four runs in the ninth. Just a god-awful series last year against the Astros. Yeah. So hopefully the yeah, Cubs can repay. That was a terrible one. Yeah, that was, no doubt, that was a terrible series. Hopefully they can repay the, the Astros at Wrigley. Yep, that would be nice. So we've got uh, two night games, and then on Thursday we've got the uh, afternoon game, as you would like to say, as God intended it. Yeah, and in the offseason, the Astros were busy. Uh, former bench coach Joe Espada, he was a guy that I actually liked over David Ross when the Cubs were looking for a new manager to replace um, Joe Madden. But, you know, he takes the reins. He's got a lot of familiar faces. But there are some pretty big additions. Josh Hader, you know him from his Brewers days and then with the Padres. He received the second biggest contract ever for a reliever. Former Cub Victor Caratini on the Astros. And then first base outfielder Trey Cabbage also there. Well, they maybe lost. if things go bad for the Astros, maybe they'll want to trade Josh Hader over back to uh, <laughs> the Cubs and he can reunite with Craig Council. Maybe. Key losses, they lost Hector Neris to the Cubs. They also lost relief pitcher Phil Manton and left fielder Michael Brantley hung him up. So, you know, th this has been a brutal series, Dustin, for the Astros. 2024 has just been a struggle. It reminds me of the 1985 Cubs that lost all of their pitching. Same thing has happened to the Astros. They're decimated by injuries, especially the pitching staff. Justin yeah. Verlander just made his first start for the Astros this Friday. Uh, Framber Valdez, elbow inflammation. Christian Javier, neck discomfort. Lance McCullers Jr., flexor surgery. Luis Garcia, Tommy John surgery. Jose, Jose Arquiti has a forearm strain. They have a 503 ERA, second worst in baseball. They enter play Sunday with a record of they had a, they entered Sunday with a record of seven and fifteen with a minus twenty two run differential. They have the fourth worst record in baseball and the fifth worst run differential. They lost two out of three to the Nationals. They're currently in last place in the NL AL West with a record of seven and sixteen. All right. Well, no uh, pity party for them after all the success they've had. All right. So Tuesday night under the lights, we got uh, Jordan Wicks out there for the Cubs. Yeah. Jordan Wicks versus Hunter Brown. Wicks is 0-2 at the 529 ERA and four starts. He's 0-2 at the no decision in his last three starts. He gave up two runs against the Dodgers on 4-6 and got the loss. He gave up four runs in the Mariners on 4-12 and got a no decision against the Diamondbacks in his last start, going 4.1 innings, giving up two runs on five hits. 5Ks to one walk. So the walks were down. One of Jordan's better starts. He did a lot better job attacking the hitters. What the coaches talked to him about is don't mess around and nibble against the bottom of the order, right? Right, right. No need for so that. The The issue with Jordan has not been his stuff. It's just been the inability to go deep into games. He usually goes four to 4.2 innings per start, but he needs to go five. He hasn't made it out of the fifth inning in any of his four starts. The Astros have never faced Wicks before. That's good. I think that's a good thing. Now, Hunter Brown is a 25-year-old righty who was 11-13 and 13 with a 509 ERA for the Astros last season. He's still searching for his first win in 2024, going 0 for 4 with a 969 ERA. He's had some tough assignments going up against the Yankees, Rangers, Royals, and Braves. In his last start against the Nationals, he went four innings pitch, gave up three runs on four hits, two walks, and six A's. Obviously, Dustin, the ERA is high. But a lot of that came on a start on April 11th when he didn't make it out of the first inning. He gave up nine runs on 11 hits. But other than that, he's had some pretty good starts. So don't be fooled by that ERA. Uh, the Cubs haven't seen Hunter Brown other than Michael Bush, who is 0 for 2 against him. He features a fastball, a cutter, and a curveball. Well, probably, a, you know, maybe a low scoring game with, uh, you know, batters not familiar with these pitchers until maybe the third time through the lineup. So we'll have to see how that one goes. All right. Game number two, we'll see uh, Jamison Tyone. Yep. I will be there on Wednesday night. Uh, Jamison Tyone versus JP. Is France. there a giveaway? Is there a giveaway Wednesday nope, night, Crowley? No giveaway. No, no, no. Nope, nope. Um, I forgot to wear my Pat Hughes sweater. God bless it. All righty. Um, Jamison had a great debut to his 2024 season. We talked about it. Five innings pitch, one run on three hits, no walks, four Ks against the Marlins. Now the Astros pitching is really bad, but they still have hitters, Dustin. Don't, don't fall asleep on that. 
It'll be a good measuring stick for JMO. Jose Abreu, Jose Altuve, and Jordan Alvarez all have good numbers traditionally against Jameson. And what do we got from the Astros? And for game three, right, and for the Astros, they are going to have J.P. France. Now, a when you, uh, Is he a rookie or a righty? <laughs> he's a, he is a righty, J.P. Okay. France. And so with J.P. France so far this season – um, he's been 0 and 2 with a 708 ERA in those games started. Uh, and when you look at him, he's a guy that he struggled on 4 7, uh, 4 6 against Texas, gave up three runs. He really struggled the next time he faced the Rangers again, four innings, gave up eight runs. But against Atlanta, not too bad. Again, Atlanta's a really good team. He went five innings pitch, gave up four hits, uh, two or runs not not that bad but when you when you talk about jp france he came up last year as well um he went 11 and 6 last year so a lot of these guys are some new names as the uh they're dealing with these injuries all right let's look at wednesday we got shota imanaga and uh justin verlander we know a lot about him yep shota has been the ace so far three and oh with one no decision he finally gave up an earned run in his last start against miami six innings pitch gave up three runs two earned on five hits five uh five k's and no walks did give up his first first home run in that game and that's something we're kind of watching for because he kind of had a reputation for giving up the long ball um but as long as they're solo not a big deal let's see how he does against the astros who have never seen him before Justin Verlander is 1-0 since coming off the AL on April 19th with right shoulder inflammation. In his first start, he pitched six innings against the Nationals. Gave up two runs on four hits, no walks, and four Ks. Last season, Verlander was steady, 13-8 with a 3.22 ERA. Has that four-seam fastball and curve slider and a curveball. Only three Cubs have seen Verlander. Jan Gomes has seen him the most, going 12 for 45. Cody Bellinger, one for eight. And Dansby only saw him once. He's 0 for three. Well, I would expect Jan Gomes then to be in the lineup if uh, 12 for 45. That's not too bad. All right, the uh, hot and the not, we kind of teased this uh, earlier. We know the knots for the Cubs. That's Dansby Swanson, Christopher Morell, Nico Horner, definitely hot. That's good to see. And who else you got on that hot list, Crowley? Yeah, Nico, 12 for 28. He's slashing 429, 429, 679 slug. Uh, Mike Talkman and Cody Bellinger both look good. Uh, Talkman seven for 19. Bellinger's warming up seven for 20. So Belly is now 350, 409, 750 in the last week. So he's starting to pick it up. And again, like we said, Morrell and uh, Swanson just really struggling, especially Morrell. All right. You mentioned that the uh, Astros still have a couple of uh, decent hitters. Their offense is kind of clicking. Tell us about that. Yeah, Maurice Dubon is the guy you're going to have to watch out most for. Center fielder, he's six. He's five for his last 13 with one home run and three RBIs. Chas McCormick's been playing left field. He's been doing well. Jeremy Pena, seven for his last 20. Uh, but some of the guys struggling, the names would kind of surprise you a little bit. Jose Altuve is four for his last 22. He's hitting 182. He got off to a good start, and now he's cooling off, uh, very similar to Dansby Swanson. And then Alec Bregman, who's on his walk year, he's one for his last 17, Dustin. And then old pal Jose Abreu, uh, yeah, he's, he's getting more really part-time bad. work. He's yeah, 0 for he's, 10. Yeah, he's not uh, look good. Again, looking like a, a guy that would fit in perfectly over at 35th and Shields. Yep, I'm taking the uh, I'm taking the shots for us, Crowley. All right, prediction time. Uh, what are we thinking? I, I'll go first. I'll say uh, two out of three because I'm going to stay glass half full. But uh, – how about how about the next time we're in a save situation? No Albert Alzale. Okay. No, no, no Albert Alzale, no four out saves. I'll say two out of three, but uh let's go, Cubs. Come on. Let, let's have Dansby Swanson wake up a little bit. Hopefully, Ian Hap's back in the lineup. Let, let's not rely completely on the home run all the time. I'm gonna say two out of three. How about you, Crowley? I I I I have to ask you, who do you got then as the closer, if not Alzale? Who do you want to see in that role? You know, honestly, Crowley, at this point, anybody. Okay, I, I'd give Ben Brown an opportunity. I wouldn't mind that. Obviously, Hector Neris, I'd give him that opportunity. I would even, you know, think about who he, he hasn't been in a high leverage situation, but I think he could do it. You know, one of the guys they just called up, right? He he what mistake, what mistake has been made? Um what, Keegan, what Thompson? Mistake, Keegan Thompson. Yeah, that was the name I was looking for. What what mistake has he made? Why not give him a chance? Uh, it, I mean, you already it, know it, what Albert Alzale does, and it's not good right now. 
And again, I'm not saying that he should go to Iowa necessarily. I'm not saying that he should go off into somewhere else or never be counted on again. But just for a minute, he needs to take a break and he needs to look at things a little bit differently. Yeah, I got the, I got the, uh, I would like to see Hector Neris see what happens, give him another shot, you know, until he blows one. But uh, I would go with Hector Neris right now because he's got the experience. I think those last three outs are the hardest three outs. I don't care what anyone says about out sure, getting or whatever. Are, it's a right. different mentality. And that's why yeah. you got Hector Neris was just in case. Thank you. And um, against his old team, right? Against his old team, probably a little bit of the competitive juice is flowing, if you will. So I think the very first time this weekend, hopefully it's tomorrow night. Listen, hopefully they got a six or seven red lead and it doesn't matter. And then you know who they should bring in? Albert Alzale. I think if the Cubs, you know, it really comes down to having those good at bats and, and advancing runners and doing those things that have made them successful so far. Dustin, right now, the Cubs are on pace for a 95 win season. So I, I just want Cubs. Yeah, of that course, we would, of course, we would take that. Of course, you take that every day. No, no I, doubt about it. I get it. It's just when you look at things on paper, Crowley, it looks pretty good. When you watch everything like we do, doesn't it doesn't quite uh, taste as good as it looks. I will just tell you one thing, and, and I'm just going to leave it at this, is that right now the Cubs record is 13 and nine. Their expected win loss record is 13 and nine. So they're exactly where they technically should be. So they've won a couple games they probably shouldn't have. They've lost a couple games they probably shouldn't have. But I got the Cubs taking two or three, and I'm hoping that Jamo has another great start while I see him. So on 15 and 10 when we get back here uh, Thursday or Friday. That's a wrap. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. Follow on all the social platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Email Crowley and I, flythew670 at gmail.com. And you can watch us, that's right, by subscribing to the 670 to score YouTube channel. Special shout out to the uh, Salsa King wearing the shirt proudly today on the podcast, Crowley. I absolutely love it. The best salsa. And don't forget the Mexicali dip. And hopefully I'll be able to eat the Salsa King nachos at Wrigley Field right now. I'll be able to have some on Wednesday. And after they win, it tastes even more delicious. Go Cubs! Hey guys, it's Crawley. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Go Cubs!